the program today, if basically we address some of these problem areas that we're going to discuss, but it just by natural uh, movement will all be above 80 per cent. So rather than getting hung up about it, it's better that we actually look at the areas where all of us are having some difficulty, address those, those areas, and then the percentage will take care of itself. But uh, with that, there's been some uh, great progress over the last uh, 12 months and uh, also some fantastic new initiatives planned for the next one to two years. And we're going to start off with a bit of a review of this with uh, Jen Bradford, uh, who's going to talk about the National Hand Hygiene Initiative and the review program and where we've been reviewing different programs and the good and bad things about various programs, almost always the good things. Uh, Jen is uh, the head of uh, infection control or hand hygiene at Vicnis, who's now on secondment to us the last year or so working at Hand Hygiene Australia and uh, she'll mention she's had been involved in a number of projects one of which has been a st in Victoria um, iPads have been rolled out to all hospitals in the state to allow electronic ordering of um, hand hygiene results and ready communication with them if there's anything that crops up in terms of superbugs or new initiatives for hand hygiene. So Jen's going to talk about these things. Thanks Jen. Thanks, Lindsay. So the Hand Hygiene Australia program reviews basically uh, commenced in 2013 and they came about as a, um, at the request of the Commission as a way of validating the data and ensuring that the health services were following the recommendations of the National Hand Hygiene Initiative and probably more importantly than that to try and identify successful innovations that were working well in health services that could be shared with other facilities. So the program reviews, basically it's, it's an interview with the hand hygiene program coordinator in each facility and it goes through all the components of a, a multimodal hand hygiene program and it also includes a short uh, auditing session either on the wards or running through some scenarios at the end to check the auditor validation. So the facilities selected, Hand Hygiene Australia team review 27 facilities a, a year and that the facilities are selected based on size, um, the larger health facilities and also on performance, so the higher performing health services. But as Lindsay mentioned, in Victoria we have a, this project running whereby all Victorian public health services will have a review this year or very early next year. So since I'll be talking about the reviews that we've done since January 2015, so 86 in total, six of those were private hospitals and as you can see a lot more in um, Victoria than the other jurisdictions because of the project. So the first section of the um, review is on system change where we asked about the product. So it takes, the whole review takes about two hours and there's a lot of questions. So I'm obviously not going to go through all the questions today but we've just selected a few from each, each section. So we asked the question, is alcohol based hand rub available at the point of care in all clinical areas? So just over 80% of facilities said yes it was which is excellent but um, there were a few where it wasn't and the reasons given for that was the common one that you'd, most people would probably expect. Paediatrics, concerns about ingestion and eye splashes and things like that. But the other thing that I found interesting, a lot of times people would say, yes, it was available at the point of care, but when you actually went and looked, it was in the rooms, but attached to the walls, and when the curtains were closed around the patients, it wasn't actually at the point of care at all. So we next moved on to healthcare worker education. And we asked the question, how often are healthcare workers required to undertake the following modes of education? And we went through all the, the common types of education that you'd expect people to do and they got to select an answer either on commencement and annually, just on commencement, just annually, intermittently, or they didn't use that particular mode of education at all. So e-learning, which is basically completion of the hand hygiene um, online learning packages. All but one of the facilities we visited used the e-learning packages and 88% of them required their healthcare workers to do an online learning package annually. 
formal pre presentation. So 57% of facilities did that on commencement, so as part of the healthcare worker induction to the hospital included hand hygiene. Um, and 27% continued that on annually. Um, uh, interestingly, quite to me anyway, quite a few facilities now don't actually do a formal presentation on commencement, but their healthcare workers get a letter directing them to the online learning packages and they just do that without any face-to-face -face education. Interactive workshops. Only 40% of facilities used that type of education and most of the ones that did, did it on an intermittent basis rather than regularly. And simulated clinical scenarios, only 33% of facilities actually used that mode of education and again it was mostly intermittent. So the more um, interactive sort of face-to-face -face but higher res or resource intensive modes were much less used than, than the others. So if they, we asked was it mandatory for healthcare workers to participate in hand hygiene education and 99% of facilities said it was. So if they said yes, we asked did they have a system in place to ensure it was um, completed for all who, for whom it was mandatory. And again, 90, 93% of um, facilities had, had a system and that was either as basic as pr people printing off and presenting their certificates or running reports either from their own local um, learning management system or the Hand Hygiene Australia online learning package reports page, which Kate will talk about the new and updated version of that um, later. So then we talked about, oh, asked questions about auditors. We asked how many active auditors at this facility, and an active auditor is an auditor who's um, collected data in the last 12 months. And obviously there's quite a range there because we went from very small hospitals to very large, but the range was zero to 20 um, for gold standard auditors and general auditors range from just one to 112. So the bigger hospitals, some of them have got a lot of auditors now. So then we asked, were all the auditors members of the infection control team? And 65% said no, they weren't. So the people that aren't part of the infection control team that are auditing are predominantly nurses, Lincoln liaison nurses or other nursing staff. But also facilities had um, auditors that came from education, allied health, and in some cases um, quality staff, medical staff, and even executive staff in some hospitals have been trained as auditors so they can understand the process. So it's really important that the auditors that are submitting data are validated and that they're doing it correctly. So that involves um, completing the auditor online package annually. Um, only 61% of facilities had uh, auditors validated by doing that annually and collected 100 moments in the last 12 months and 75% of them had done that. If they're active, it makes sense that most of them have collected 100 moments in the last 12 months. So then still looking at um, consistency and, and validation of the data, we asked, are any of the following methods used to ensure auditing practice is consistent with the National Hand Hygiene Initiative? So we asked people, did they do side-by-side -side, um, or auditor refresher sessions? And that's mainly in the larger health services where they've got a, a coordinator that's quite experienced and can run the sessions. Side-by-side -side auditing, where at least a couple of auditors get together and audit the same scenario so you can check if they're um, consistent. Data review was the common answer most people gave to um, keeping consistent, so looking for any obvious discrepancies in the data. And other methods were things like um, meetings, getting together and discussing difficult scenarios that they'd come across, um, email communication with tips and uh, education and also in some cases infection control would go in and re-audit areas where there was surprising results like particularly high or, or low. So then we did the um, short auditing session with the, the key auditor or auditors in the facility and we rated them against the Hand Hygiene Australia auditor and said whether there was either a close correlation, minor discrepancies, major differences or for various reasons that wasn't performed. And in the majority of cases, there was just a few little minor discrepancies. And the common things 
that we found where auditors were just not getting it quite right was omitting the moment four in the um, one action, two moment scenarios or what we used to call double moments and also um, often uh, call, considering the curtains part of the patient zone and auditing them as a moment five. So then we talked about the audit process. So we wanted to know how um, people were selecting their wards for auditing. So there's two main options that uh, you're probably familiar with. Option A where they do um, ICU and high risk areas if applicable and rotate their other wards and option B where again ICU and high risk if applicable and do all other acute areas in the facility every audit period. So it was pretty much half and half with one facility changing between the two. So for the uh, health services that went with option A, we asked for all acute inpatient areas included in the rotation. 42% said um, oh, yes and 58% said no. So there were acute areas that were not being included for, for various reasons. And traditionally or in the past, most health services focused on their acute inpatient ordinary ward type settings but more recently we've become interested in, in hand hygiene performance outside of these areas in the more specialised but still quite acute areas. So we um, looked at for example perioperative, I can't read this without my glasses on, but perioperative national audits only 44% um, of people submitted data. Emergency department 68% of people submitted data to the national and radiology so interventional type. Um, radiology units, national 30% submitted data to the national initiative. So they were sort of maybe the areas that people were, were not, um, or not everyone was concentrating on. Oops, sorry. Wrong way. So we then went on to this was more about um, gaining the perceptions of the hand hygiene program coordinator and, and what they thought was the successful components of the program in their health service. So we asked the question, how effective do you believe that each of the following factors have been in improving or sustaining hand hygiene performance of, amongst healthcare workers in your organisation? So had they actually worked for them and they had to rate them on a scale one to five with one being not at all effective and five being extremely effective. So um, alcohol-based hand rub at the point of care, 96% of people thought that that was very um, effective, extremely or very effective. Education, 79% of people, which I thought was, I was a bit surprised because often you'll say, a lot of people will say that education is not that helpful, but most people felt that it was. Auditing and performance feedback, 85% of people. System of personal accountability for behaviour with regards to hand hygiene, only 23% of people felt that that was effective and, and mo that was a lot of the organisations had no system. So that was not applicable to them. Reminders in the workplace, so posters. The health services that had their own localised versions felt that they were effective but mostly people thought people didn't take a lot of notice of the posters, especially if they weren't changed frequently. Support from hospital leadership was rated highly. Patient engagement in hand hygiene promotion, not so um, popular and again not a lot of um, health services had a program for that. The National Hand Hygiene Initiative and the National Safety and Quality Health Service Standards both rated very highly with people thinking they had uh, made a difference to hand hygiene in their organisation. And public reporting of hand hygiene compliance rates, so having the results out there on my hospitals, most people thought it didn't make much difference. So 31% thought it was very effective and the rest, the rest didn't. So then we asked um, what initiative has had the biggest impact on hand hygiene performance at this hospital and it was overwhelmingly almost everyone straight away said having the alcohol based hand rub at the point of care. The others not really in any particular order but mandatory completion of the online learning package, local ownership and um, clinical champions and ward based auditors so performing the audits and performing sort of more informal um, education to their colleagues. So that's really the direction a lot of health services are going in now, having a lot of ward-based 
auditors, um, auditing and performance feedback itself and transparent reporting of results. So the places that put the results out there either on the hospital intranet or on their quality boards and the, each ward knew how the others were going, got a bit of competition happening, um, had made a difference. We then asked what are the biggest barriers you've encountered and again probably um, overwhelmingly and probably not surprisingly to you guys, most people said medical staff but also generally staff um, attitudes. So these words were the words that people use, complacency, disinterest, indifference, um, scepticism, resistance, arrogance, apathy and fatigue sort of featured. Misunderstandings about the five moments and how they apply in practice. So do they apply in certain settings and, and you know, is it confusing people? Time and resources to just keep going with the program. And also quite a few people said a lack, lack of local evidence that improving hand hygiene has reduced healthcare associated infection. So people wanted to see the evidence by that improving their hand hygiene initiative, this particular infection rate was now zero or lower. So just in summary, um, the successes and there's you know, a lot of successes, alcohol based hand rub, no doubt that it's um, at the point of care in most clinical areas. Hand hygiene education for healthcare workers mandatory in many facilities. Local ownership of the hand hygiene program and um, having a lot of ward based auditors, lots of health services are doing that now. Widespread executive support for the program, so most people felt that they had the support. And then just there's a few key areas that still require um, improvement. So engaging medical staff, making sure all the auditors are validated and consistent. Hand hygiene performance in specialist areas like emergency department and perioperative areas. And just um, maintaining enthusiasm and, and sustaining um, momentum for the program. So a lot of those areas you'll be hearing talks about today. So hopefully we'll all go away encouraged and um, revitalised. Thanks. Time for just one, one or two quick questions. Any of you have a question? So, Jen, just with um, personal accountability, was that because most places didn't have a program and so they hadn't tried it, or they tried it and it hadn't worked? Uh, both, because one of the options, so whether they on the scale of one, one to five, they could also say um, not applicable, but not applicable as if they didn't have a program, and so probably most didn't. In, yeah. I'm sorry, I was asking the section about um, the education, mm -hmm. um, whether there was practical learning and things like that, the percentages were low, but I think, was it included in your, I'm not sure whether it was included in your question when you interviewed, whether it was because um, infection control professionals felt that they, it was an important component, but the hospital level didn't give that time, like there was no process in place, like, you know, we want to give the education, but you know, that there's no support. So whose fault was it? Yes, I think, um, I think pretty much everyone agreed that it would be a good, you know, a, a helpful thing to do, but obviously, yes, very resource intensive to do that, and they're struggling, I guess, just to get the induction done and the annual stuff and everything else. So, yeah, more of that. We didn't, you know, spe specifically ask it in the tool, but in, in discussions with the people, it was more that, you know, they'd be happy to do it if they had the time, but, yeah, they didn't. <laughs> I mean, I think it's an irony, isn't it, that in all the induction, at least for the medical staff, you know, they get all this stuff about the payroll and where they pick up all these other things, but nothing about patient safety. You know, they just start on the job with no training about patient safety. Anyway, look, we might clip it here and then we'll move on. I know we've got some other questions, but we'll have some questions at the end of the next session. So, 